Now, we talked earlier a little bit uh, about uh, pressure differentials. And so if you look at the graphic on the left, this is what happens uh, when we have supply duct leaks. Supply ducts that are outside of the building envelope, they cause the structure to be under negative pressure. Because what happens is, let's say we have a 1200 CFM system. And let's say that we have 300 CFM of duct leaks. And that 300 CFM of duct leak is leaking into the attic. That means there's only 900 CFM coming out of the supply registers. But the return air side of that system is pulling 1,200 CFM. That means that 300 CFM is going to be leaking through all the cracks and gaps in the wall system. And in a hot, humid climate or during hot, humid weather, that can draw warm, moist air in through all those cracks and gaps and lead to problems, in addition to a big energy penalty. Likewise, if we have return air duct leaks, just the opposite happens. Return air duct leaks that are located outside the building envelope cause the home to be under a positive pressure. And that's a problem in the winter months. If we have humidified air inside the home being forced out through all the cracks and gaps, that can also lead to mold and moisture problems because that warm, moist air, when it comes in contact with the cold exterior sheathing or components, can condense and lead to mold problems. Here's an example. If we have warm, moist air that infiltrates through the wall system and it hits the back of the drywall that say home is being cooled in the summer months, it can actually get condensation. And that's another reason why the building codes have lightened up a bit on the vapor retarder requirements in climates that are hot and humid because you don't want that vapor retarder to be a place where moisture can condense if you do have a home that's under a negative pressure. So this is what we're really striving for is the balanced system where the ducts are sealed and when the system operates we don't have negative or positive pressure differentials across the building envelope. However, Many of the homes today do not have return air ducts in each room. They might have one central return. So if we have a bedroom door closed, that could cause that room to be under a positive pressure, which might, be, might cause an adjacent room to be under a negative pressure, which could cause a fireplace to backdraft, for example. When bedroom doors are closed, for example, they can, as I mentioned, be under a positive pressure. So how do you equalize that? How do you balance the system? Well, a simple way to do that without adding a whole return air duct that goes all the way back to the, the return air plenum is to use a transfer grill or you even use a jump duct. In this case, this is a transfer grill and you can see in this illustration that we have a opening in, this, in the stud cavity at the top of the um, uh, stud cavity at the wall and then at the bottom we also have another transfer grill that allows air to flow through it. Now another uh, option is to go with what we call a jump duct. So you can see that we have a, a, a stud wall here that's a hallway and all they simply do is put a, a, a register, a, some ductwork, and a grill that kind of jumps over that wall and uh, on this illustration on the right we're seeing this happen in the floor system and that equalizes the pressure in an equal manner. Now let's talk about the mandatory requirements with regards to system uh, piping and insulation uh, for circling hot water systems and hydronic systems. HVA piping, uh, if it's like a typical hydronic system or if the water temperatures are, you know, 105 to 55 degrees, uh, requires an R3. Your typical circulating hot water systems uh, require to have an R2. The circulating pump has to have an on-off switch that's readily accessible so that pump can be turned on or off. Those are mandatory requirements. Another mandatory requirement is mechanical ventilation. In 403.5, we know that uh, it tells us that ventilation is, can, uh, we need to have outdoor air intakes and exhausts that have automatic or gravity dampers. The point here is that we want those dampers to automatically close when the ventilation system is not operating. The concept behind this part of the code is that recognizing that as we're tightening up houses, we need to have some fresh air ventilation. And we can do that in a number of different ways, but it's important that the ductwork that we use to provide that fresh air into the system uh, has dampers on it that aren't operating uh, when the ventilation system is not operating or when the HVAC system is not operating. Equipment sizing. Um, the IECC definitely refers to the mechanical code and uh, requires that load calculations be done to ensure that uh, the, the building is comfortable but no larger than absolutely necessary. So we use the Air Conditioning Contractors Association of America, uh, their sizing protocols. And so we use Manual J to determine the building loads, use Manual S to select the equipment. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, Manual D to design the ducts. Uh, but this is a requirement uh, within the code. So we want to make sure that we have adequate sizing. 
So when we look at a, uh, a typical system, it's also, we, we have a distribution system, we have an outdoor system, we have a, a furnace and an air handler. It's important that each individual system have its own setback thermostat. Uh, with regards to snow melt controls, uh, we have to have a snow detector that will activate the system from idle mode to the snow, snow mold melt mode. Also, it requires a slab temperature sensor that turns the system off when the surface temperature is above 50 degrees. Another important feature of the re mandatory requirements is that the temperature control shuts the system down when the outdoor temperature is above 40 degrees. So these automatic controls go a long way to reducing a lot of waste in these types of systems. It's important to point out nowhere in the Kentucky Residential Code does it require a snow melt system to be installed. However, if a system is provided, these controls are mandatory. Another requirement around pools is that they have to have a readily accessible on-off switch um, and that natural gas uh, or LP fire heaters cannot have uh, burning pilot nights. Also, they have to have time switches, uh, automatic controls to operate pool heaters and pumps on a preset schedule. There's no need to run those pumps more than we need to. And the only exceptions are is where public health standards require 24-hour operation or where pumps are required to operate uh, solar uh, heating systems or waste heat recovery systems for pools. Uh, pools are required to have a pool cover, and the pool cover must be a vapor uh, retardant. Also, pools heated over 90 degrees must have a minimum of R12 insulation. And the only exception for that is pools deriving uh, greater than 60% of their energy for heating uh, from a site-recovered energy or from a solar source. 